He managed to restrain him somehow. But Link, I am not sure you'll be able to stop him. I came to this era after finding a man underground. When I witnessed what the secret stone did to Ganondorf, at that moment, I knew for sure what we found underground, that was him. He was still alive, still powerful. He continues to live on all the way until my time. Leave no survivors! Eliminate this kingdom and her allies. Years from now, someone will appear with the sword that seals the darkness. The swordsman with the power to defeat you. Link, remember this name. Ever since Link and Zelda had ventured below the castle to investigate the gloom, Hyrule had been a land without a ruler, desperately searching for any sign of its missing princess. And since the upheaval, there was hope. Reports of sightings of Zelda came in from all across the country, of the princess visiting stables and villages, even Hyrule Castle itself. But when Link, and the sages he had awakened from each of the four regions, had stormed the floating citadel, they had uncovered the truth. This was not Hyrule's princess, but Ganondorf himself, a phantom conjured by his power, designed to sabotage and manipulate Hyrule from the inside. Ganondorf's puppet had been responsible for all of the regional phenomena, and had appeared at Hyrule Castle specifically to lure Link into a trap. And this would have worked. Link would have once again fallen victim to the terrible gloom, were it not for the intervention of the sages. The mystery of the actual Princess Zelda's disappearance had only grown deeper but the truth of the upheaval itself was now clear to everyone. It had been caused by the return of Ganondorf, the Demon King from the legend of the Imprisoning War. News of the Demon King's return spread like wildfire, printed on the front page of newspapers and muttered under the breath of stable owners. Link and the sages convene with Pura at Lookout Landing to form a plan. They are all now aware of the identity of Puppet Zelda, and that the real Zelda must have travelled somehow to the distant past, as when each of them had awakened as a sage, they had seen visions of the confrontation with Ganondorf, and of their predecessors talking to Princess Zelda. They know that Zelda had come up with a plan to defeat the Demon King, that they were destined to fight alongside Link now that he has returned in the present day. But other than that, they don't know anything about Ganondorf, his story or his goals, other than that he is bad news and super strong. Pura notices that when the sages told her of the visions they'd seen of the distant past, there had been six sages supporting King Raru in the battle. Wind, fire, water, lightning, time, but also spirit. 
Minoru. Pura notes that each of the sages present had awoken at ancient ruins from the time of King Raru, and guesses that Minoru might be found in a similar place. The group splits up to search for clues. Tulin, Yonobo, Sidon, and Riju return to their regions to hunt there, but Link instead heads towards the home of the Sheikah, Kakariko Village. Ever since the upheaval, Zelda's Zonai survey team had been investigating strange, ring-shaped ruins that had fallen directly on top of Kakariko Village. During Breath of the Wilds, the chief of Kakariko Village had been Impa, a royal advisor to the king and queen before the Great Calamity. Like Pura and Robbie, by the time of the game, she is around 120 years old. The Sheikah are notably longer lived than Hylians, so even at this age she was able to serve as the village's chief, but at some point after the fall of Calamity Ganon, she decided to pass the torch to her granddaughter, Paya. One day, Impa suddenly announced that Paya would take over her duties, and instead began researching old books in the village. Paya was blindsided by the announcement. She didn't yet feel ready for such a responsibility, and felt that her grandmother's chief's hat was too heavy for her head. When the upheaval happened, and the ring ruins rained down on Kakariko, Impa suddenly announced that she planned to leave. Together with Kado, she packed her bags. Paya pleaded for her to stay, but Impa insisted that an event like the upheaval was precisely the reason she must go. The new chief conceded and bid her grandmother farewell, but not before noticing something in her eyes that said she was embarking on some great mission. Paya later looked through the books that Impa had been reading, and discovered eleven strange symbols inside, symbols which she believes are related to Impa's quest. The books Impa had been reading concerned the geoglyphs, eleven symbols which had mysteriously appeared on Hyrule's surface since the upheaval. If viewed from high above, these giant symbols become clear, from the Master Sword to a Secret Stone or the Pura Pad. For this reason, Impa and Kado travel across the land in a hot air balloon given to them by Pura providing them with the altitude necessary to properly study these markings. Each geoglyph makes use of many teardrop shapes, and these hold a secret. One teardrop contains a dragon's tear, a small, circular pool. These dragon's tears are the spots where the light dragon's actual tears fell. Right after Zelda transformed, she shed memories of her time in the distant past that became embedded in the land at these sacred sites. When Link interacts with the pool, he experiences a vision, a memory from Zelda's time in the distant past. These dragon's tears, then, have existed for millennia. Ancient people found these sites, and they, too, experienced visions of Zelda's past. Impa claims that a passage found in old literature from Kakariko Village describes this, and notes that a group of people in the distant past, possibly Sheikah themselves, marked these sites with images depicting what they saw in the visions. Interestingly, these ancient people must have also had some ability to control time. Link is only able to see the visions as the tears react to his recall ability. At some point, a chamber was built in the back of the Forgotten Temple to catalogue these glyphs, a great map of the kingdom, with each symbol marked on the wall surrounding it. We can tell that this chamber was built sometime after the construction of Hyrule Castle over the seal, as the castle is represented on the map. The room just before this was the very place where Raru had planned Hyrule's defence, and granted the sages with the secret stones. And even now, thousands of years later, Link can find a stone marking Sonia's grave, where Raru once grieved. Interestingly, Sonia's gravestone is surrounded by sundelion flowers, which grow on Sky Islands and can cure the effects of gloom. Perhaps the Sundelion somehow represented Sonia, just like how the Silent Princess represents her direct descendant. 
Zelda, whose story is immortalized in the next room. For whatever reason, these geoglyphs weren't visible until after the upheaval. The recent events triggered something and caused them to appear. Ganondorf's return causing the appearance of the glyphs seems to have been a part of the plan of whoever created them. Pyre notes that Impa left Kakariko immediately after the upheaval, cryptically noting that times like these are exactly why she must leave. Just like Breath of the Wild, Link again ventures across the kingdom, piecing together a story from a distant age, bit by bit. Collecting the tears of a deity is a staple in the Zelda series. Link has previously collected sacred tears in Skyward Sword's Silent Realms and the light tears in Twilight Princess. A teardrop specifically containing information was seen in Breath of the Wild with the ancient Sheikah technology. If it was Impa's Sheikah ancestors who found the Tears of the Light Dragon and created geoglyphs around them, perhaps this, in turn, inspired something about the tribe's symbols. Just like how the ancient sages and their temples went on to inspire the designs of the Sheikah's divine beasts. Only after he's recovered all of the Dragon's Tears memories does Link uncover the truth about Princess Zelda. <laughs> Upon seeing the final vision, the Light Dragon appears above Link, and from it falls a single tear, landing in the center of the Wrist Peninsula. This final dragon's tear is formed from Zelda's memory of becoming the Light Dragon, revealing to Link her terrible fate. As Link wakes from this final memory, the Light Dragon roars and circles above his head and the hero finds the area where the tear fell full of silent princess flowers. Zelda's flowers. Not only does he now know the sinister identity of the princess that has appeared since the upheaval, he now knows the truth about the real princess's sacrifice. He has found his Zelda, but she is lost, trapped forever in a body not her own. But Link's quest must continue. He must find the fifth sage and bring the fight to the Demon King. After Impa had left Kakariko in search of the geoglyphs, Pyre had informed Pura of the ring ruins that had landed on her village, who claimed that Zonai ruins shaped like this are incredibly unusual. Pyre then contacted the Zonai survey team, who in turn traveled to the village to investigate. It was soon discovered that each ring contained stone slabs marked with Zonai text. Fascinating discoveries that were translated by Toro, head of the ZST. He learned that each described details about the ancient sages, the secret stones, and the imprisoning war. A fifth ring ruin was found directly above Kakariko Village's north gate, ominously suspended in the air. But Ganondorf had sent his phantom saboteur to the Sheikah's hometown too. According to the villagers, Princess Zelda herself had traveled to Kakariko to inspect the ruins that had fallen there. She had ordered that the floating ruin was off limits, without expressing any concern for the well-being of the villagers. The ring ruins breathe new life into the Sheikah's hometown. Researchers and tourists alike pour into the village, having travelled from all corners of Hyrule to see, or even study, the mysterious relics from a forgotten civilization that have rained down on Kakariko. Dorian's youngest daughter, Coco, even sets up a little shop selling ring garlands to celebrate this occasion. Dr. Callip a researcher who originally lived in a hut near Fort Hateno before joining the ZST, is responsible for restricting access to the floating ring ruin, which he does with irritating efficiency. Only after destroying the phantom in the castle, and explaining the truth about puppet Zelda to Pyre, does Calip let up, allowing Link to ascend into the floating ruin and photograph the stone slab inside for Toro to translate. The head of the survey team isn't able to fully translate the slab, but what he can make out tells of Minoru, and mentions a key hidden in the southeast. 
Finally, a clue to the location of the missing sage. Pyre, who had been learning how to translate Zonai's script since the upheaval, is able to contribute to Toro's translation, adding that the slab appears to mention the Dragon Land. She suggests that they search in the Farron region, a place connected with the ancient Zonai found in the southeast, known as the Zonai Ruins. Before the upheaval and the emergence of the Sky Islands, this was the largest, and perhaps most mysterious, Zonai site left on Hyrule's surface. Great walls and statues are built along the winding Drakozu River, the serpentine shape of which inspired the ancient song called The Serpent's Jaws. The Zonai ruins were where the mystery of this lost tribe began in Breath of the Wild, and fittingly, it's where the mystery ends in Tears of the Kingdom. The Zonai survey team moves to the Farron region, and Pyre's translation is proven correct. Together with Kalip and Toro, Link uncovers a sequence of ancient chambers containing the Charged Robes, a set once used in ancient rituals, presumably designed to worship Farosh, the lightning dragon who is often spotted in the skies directly above this region. The Zonai ruins in Farron are another location that appears to have changed since the upheaval. New, taller dragon statues appear, built from the same smooth white stone as the Sky Islands, rather than the weathered stone of the rest of the surface ruins. Like the appearance of the islands themselves, and the emergence of the geoglyphs around the dragon's tears, it seems that Ganondorf's resurrection triggered a response from ancient Zonai sites, opening pathways for the hero that Zelda had promised. The Zonai ruins' new statues reveal their secret when struck by lightning. They disperse the eternal thunderstorm that cloak the islands above this region, allowing Link to make his way to Dragonhead Island and find Minoru's mask. This owl-shaped device was developed by Minoru in the distant past, seen here when she talks to Zelda. Somehow, it reacts to the presence of Minoru's spirit inside the Pura Pad, and the Sage of Spirit is able to speak. She guides Link first to the surface, and then into the endless depths below. Of course, Minoru had decided to join Zelda in her plan to reach the future. Instead of consuming her secret stone and draconifying, she instead transferred her spirit to the Pura Pad, which was guarded by a steward construct on the Great Sky Island until it was given to Link. Minoru had intended to awaken alongside Zelda's knight, but like with the four regional phenomena, Ganondorf had focused some of his power on stopping the re-emergence of the Sage of Spirits, too. Link brings the mask to the Construct Factory, where Minoru once created machines to serve as vessels for her spirit. In the distant past, she had built a colossal construct here, and showed it to Zelda. It was so big and so powerful that the princess was able to ride on its shoulders like riding a horse. Minoru's original plan was to guide Link to this construct as soon as he received the Pura Pad. But there was a problem. When Ganondorf returned, he managed to seize control of Minoru's construct where it lay dormant, deep underground, just like he had seized control of the Guardians and Divine Beasts during the Great Calamity. Link is instead required to gather parts from the various storehouses to build Minoru a new body. A new, giant mecha, like the one she had built and shown to Zelda in the distant past, and the ultimate weapon created by the Yiga clan. With the construct operational, Minoru guides him to the Spirit Temple just southeast, where she had hidden away her secret stone. The platform directly before the Secret Stone's chamber is soaked in gloom, and without warning, an electrified fence rises to trap Link and Minoru's construct inside. A platform opens in the floor, and from it leaps Minoru's forgotten project, the original construct, now possessed by a different spirit. Ganondorf's gloom fuels it from within twisting it into a savage killing machine. 
the most dangerous game of Rock'em Sock'em Robots begins, with Link and Minoru controlling the new construct and Ganondorf the seized construct. Both machines bring the pinnacle of Zonai engineering to bear against one another. Spiked balls and electric blades smash through ancient armor, and cannon fire shakes the subterranean temple. Eventually, though, Link and Minoru are victorious. The seized construct is destroyed, opening the way to the final secret stone. Minoru's spirit jumps out of the Pura Pad and floats towards the secret stone, which in turn jumps into the construct body Link had just created. The fifth sage was awakened. Minoru had returned to the battle after thousands of years. Minoru tells Link about the story of the imprisoning war, of Zelda the Sage of Time and of her sacrifice to empower the Master Sword. She explains that Zelda had given her a message, to tell Link to speak to the Great Deku Tree and recover the Blade of Evil's Bane. It's unclear whether or not the Great Deku Tree existed in the time of King Raru. It doesn't appear to be present in the same location here, or at least, if it is, it didn't yet have such a giant spread of cherry blossom leaves. But we know that this Deku Tree is ancient, and has watched over Hyrule for countless years. Regardless of whether or not it existed yet in the distant past, Zelda was somehow able to relay a message to the tree. Perhaps she spoke to it long after her draconification, communicating with the forest deity as the Light Dragon to inform it of her plan. But the Korok Forest, and its guardian, also suffered with the return of Ganondorf. A shadowy fog clouded the Lost Woods, and the Deku Tree itself suffered a curse. A splinter of Ganondorf's raw power tortured him from within, and the forest's Koroks were paralyzed due to their father's condition. This is very similar to the Deku Tree's fate in Ocarina of Time, where Ganondorf cursed it with the parasitic Queen Goma, which also rotted the deity from the inside. But this time, Ganondorf took an even more direct approach. The Deku Tree's curse was Phantom Ganon, created from the Demon King's flesh and blood, just like the saboteur that had disguised itself as Zelda. Destroying this phantom restores the Deku Tree's vitality, and returns the Korok Forest to a peaceful sanctuary. Now recovered, the Deku Tree can speak to Link for the first time since before the upheaval, the time when Link and Zelda had travelled to the forest to retrieve the Master Sword. The Deku Tree notes that Link no longer has it, but claims that he can sense the blade in the head of the Light Dragon, where it has been for thousands of years. After healing the Deku Tree and learning of the Master Sword's fate, Link finds that the Light Dragon has lowered its altitude. Almost as if it knows that Link is searching for it, it begins to fly much closer to the surface, allowing the hero to jump from the heavens and land on its back, clinging to the Master Sword for dear life. The Light Dragon screams and writhes its body, trying to shake Link like the very act of touching the blade causes it pain. It swings its head violently from side to side, but by this point, Link has recovered enough of his lost vitality to hold on, desperately, until... The dragon subsides, and glides silently higher and higher. After a flash of light, Link finds himself in a realm of golden skies. Only white clouds and sunbeams break up the heavenly space. The light dragon's hair uncoils from the blade, allowing Link to gently remove it. The blade that was broken shall return to Hyrule.
A vision appears to Link of the princess, floating in a sea of white light, pouring her power into the blade. Interestingly, the back of her right hand glows with a bright golden light, and it's this light that flows into the sword, repairing it. When Zelda used her sealing powers in Breath of the Wild, it was represented by the mark of the Triforce appearing on her hand, and it seems like the same thing happens here, as she guides this sacred light directly into the sword that seals the darkness. The Master Sword itself has been transformed by its time with the Light Dragon. Though Zelda's power has restored the blade, the scars of Ganondorf's attack are still visible. It seems that the sword has also been imbued with ancient Zonai powers too. It reacts when its wielder uses the Zonai Fuse ability. Mysterious green symbols appear along the blade, and fused materials take on a ghostly green shade. Though she had succeeded in delivering the blade to Link, Zelda's sacrifice was permanent. She had become an eternal dragon doomed to wander the skies forever. The Light Dragon drops Link off at the Temple of Time, then flies away, without a word, to continue her endless solitude. But Zelda had done it. Her last thoughts before she lost herself were of Link. She knew that he would arrive in the future and protect them all. And now, with the sages awakened again, a battle tens of thousands of years in the making could begin. Link and Pura convene for a final time at Lookout Landing. The hero informs her of the awakening of the Sage of Spirit, and of the discovery of the Master Sword in the Light Dragon's head. This means that Zelda's plan from the distant past was almost complete. All that remained was finding Ganondorf himself. Pura suggests that Link not look on the surface or the skies above, but instead search below their feet, in the hellish depths below the ground. The depths are quite literally the underworld, a dark world that mirrors Hyrule above it. The depths are home to Poes, lost spirits of the dead who can be guided to the afterlife by Bargainer statues, which are themselves dark reflections of the goddess statues found directly above them. The spirits of soldiers float above grave markers, offering up weapons. These are presumably soldiers who lost their lives to the Great Calamity a hundred years ago, like these three gathered directly underneath Castletown, which was at the heart of the Guardian Assault. Monsters in the depths never sleep, with the obvious exception of the Hinox. They gather in groups and mine for Zonites, which they harvest for some unknown purpose. Pools of gloom stain the surface, crawling with giant, dark roots, pulsing with Ganondorf's energy. Like veins, these dark roots are spread across the entire depths, but are focused on Ganondorf's lair, deep below the castle. This has been apparent since the very beginning of the game, of course. Link and Zelda both saw Ganondorf allow himself to fall into the black pit below where he had been imprisoned. So, following his own footsteps, Link begins his final descent into the bowels of the castle, to his kingdom's forgotten foundations. Directly below the floating castle is the Hyrule Castle Chasm, the pit that opened up when the citadel was thrust upwards when the seal broke. We can see here that the castle isn't actually levitating, but instead sits on a thin, tall pillar of ancient stone, marked with Zonai symbols. This stone column was directly connected to the platform Ganondorf had pushed upwards with his gloom after he awoke, forcibly moving the entire structure upwards. At the bottom of this great chasm are tunnels from the distant past, leading to old stone passageways and staircases built by the Hyruleans in a forgotten age. Eventually, Link reaches the very same tunnels he had explored with Zelda at the beginning of the game, before the princess had travelled to the past. 
We don't know exactly how Link and Zelda accessed these tunnels originally, only that a hidden staircase had been discovered during the investigation into the gloom. Now, after the upheaval, the Forgotten Foundation can only be accessed through the depths now that the castle has moved, so perhaps whatever route originally led here has been displaced or blocked off by the disturbance. The first time Link walked here, these tunnels had been eerily empty, save for a small group of keys, and were filled with a thin, wispy form of gloom. But now that the Demon King has awoken, his gloom has completely choked this place. It has gathered in pools on the floor, and surrounds powerful monsters. With the Blade of Evil's Bane on his back, Link continues, deeper and deeper into where it all started. Ganondorf's aura grows stronger the further down Link delves, until the gloom is strong enough to break the spiritual connection Link and Raru's hand has with the sages. Their avatars cannot reach this deep. Link goes alone. Eventually, he reaches the Mural Chamber, where he and Zelda had discovered ancient depictions of Hyrule's earliest history, of the birth of the kingdom and the outbreak of the imprisoning war. Now, equipped with explosives or blunt weapons, Link uncovers the blocked murals, and finds Zelda's journey in the past immortalised in stone, as it always had been. A short distance from the mural room is the imprisoning chamber itself, the cave in which Ganondorf had been held for millennia. Now, of course, the centre of the chamber is missing. It had collapsed when Ganondorf broke free. Link has only one option, to continue his descent, to jump into the pit where Zelda had fallen. At the bottom is a cluster of rubble, zonai stonework that had fallen from the imprisoning chamber above, now lying broken in pools of gloom. And this wasn't all that had fallen from above. On the floor, Link finds a single torch. The torch that Zelda had dropped when she fell. This was it. Link reaches the end of the cavern, where it opens up to reveal one final drop. <laughs> Gloom's lair is the deepest point of the depths, close to 2,500 meters below the surface. It couldn't be further from the Light Dragon's golden skies far above the clouds. If the dark roots that pulse in the depths are veins, this is the heart. This is the point from which all of the roots have grown from. It's clear that this has happened since Ganondorf's awakening. Roots have burst through into the mural room since Link and Zelda first visited. Gloom flows like blood inside them, a rhythmic pull of dark energy down into the bottom of the depths. Ganondorf has the power to control darkness, and a secret stone to amplify this power, so perhaps these roots are a way in which he can feed on the darkness of the depths absorbing the power of Hyrule's underworld to fuel his magic. Riju had been right. Ganondorf had returned, but was not yet at full strength. Gloom's lair seems to function as a cocoon to rebirth the Demon King into the present day, just like the cocoon of Calamity Ganon, which served the same purpose. In a dark reflection of Link's revival in the Shrine of Resurrection, inside the heart of Gloom's lair, Ganondorf's physical body rests on a platform, absorbing the gloom around him. He is unimaginably old, and after countless thousands of years of imprisonment, his powers have weakened. Which is to say, he was able to cripple Link and break the Master Sword with only a fraction of his true strength but he was not yet prepared for Link. 
The hero lands on the great tree and is met by a host of monsters, summoned from flares of gloom. He steals himself and prepares for combat But Link is not alone. The sages arrive at the 11th hour to join Hyrule's hero in the final battle. Tulin, the Sage of Wind, Yonobo, Sage of Fire, King Sidon, Sage of Water, and Riju, Sage of Lightning, had journeyed into the depths to confront Ganondorf, alongside Minoru, the Sage of Spirit, housed within her newly built construct. In the distant past, Ganondorf had been confronted by an alliance of seven warriors carrying secret stones. Wind, fire, water, lightning, and spirit. But also Zelda as the Sage of Time, and Raru with his power of light. But in the present day, time and light are missing. Or are they? In the Temple of Time on the Great Sky Island, Link had touched a ghostly projection of Zelda's secret stone, and through her, is able to use the power of recall to manipulate time. And the hero's right arm is not his own, it's Raru's right arm, now imbued with lights of blessing from shrines, purging the evil within it. Link carries with him the powers of both Zelda and Raru, time and light. He is, in essence, two sages at once. Together, this group of six warriors echo the seven that had battled the Demon King long ago. Ganondorf sends out wave after wave of his minions, each spawns like the ones he had attacked Raru's Hyrule with. When this proves to be useless against the sages, he instead focuses his strength and summons his most powerful creations, the bosses with which he had tried to prevent the sages from finding their secret stones, that were previously slain with the help of the hero. But the sages don't need help anymore. They've already fought these monsters. Each of them has mastered their ability and harnessed a secret stone to amplify it. The sages recognize Ganondorf's plan to delay their attack, and each choose to stay outside of the lair itself, to fight off the resurrected bosses and buy Link time to confront the Demon King. Link leaves his friends behind and enters the Heart of Darkness, once again alone. The Demon King rests in the center of the tree-like structure, on a strange, spiked platform, like a dark reflection of the lotus bud flowers used by the Zonai in their architecture and symbolism. He sits with his legs crossed in the lotus position, meditating like the ancient Sheikah monks, drawing power to complete his resurrection. Ganondorf speaks. He is disappointed by Link, and regrets that there is not a more worthy foe to oppose him. Just like how Link gathered light energy into his damaged arm, he gathers his gloom into an orb in his hand, then slams it into the ground. This creates a whirling storm of dark energy, like that which had surrounded him after he stole Sonya's secret stone. Ganondorf, the ancient king of the Gerudo, is reborn into Hyrule. Of course, this isn't Ganondorf's final form. His secret stone is firmly planted on his forehead, but he isn't yet using its full power to transform him into his demonic form. This could be because he is not yet at full strength, having only just rehydrated from his mummified form, but it's also possible that Ganondorf chooses to engage Link in his Gerudo form out of pride. Even without the Secret Stone, Ganondorf is an exceptionally powerful warrior, and he knows it. His worldview is shaped by power alone, and throughout the entire story, he has been dismissive of Link's strength. With only a fraction of his true power, Ganondorf had crippled the hero Raru had promised, and shattered his legendary sword. Ganondorf respected Raru, not as a king, but as a powerful warrior. In the castle, his spectre had mockingly congratulated Link for defeating Phantom Ganon, 
admitting that there might be more to him than the power Raru had given him, but not much more. Link is not a worthy challenger for Ganondorf's right to rule, and so the Gerudo King faces him as a mortal. In the deepest, darkest corner of the depths, the duel begins. Ganondorf is a master of all forms of combat, and shapes dark weapons out of gloom. A blade, a spear, a club, and a bow. All of which he uses with pinpoint accuracy and devastating power. Like any monster in the depths, Ganondorf's attacks not only deal direct damage, but wither their targets. The gloom breaks heart containers. The fight against Ganondorf is a straight fight, a major test of strength, two warriors, one against one. And like Link, Ganondorf is able to move faster than what should be possible, fast enough to dodge the hero's strikes in bullet time. Flurry Rush, and the ability to slow time while aiming, is implied to be part of why Link is considered such a powerful warrior. Daruk's training journal mentions how Link explains that when he focuses, it feels like time slows down around him. This skill is what has enabled him to take down countless monstrous foes, from Moblins to Lynels to Calamity Ganon itself. But Ganondorf is different. He, too, is able to slow time around him to dodge the impossible. But Link is better. Like the Gerudo King, Link is a master of all types of weapons, a warrior of Herculean strength that has been broken and reforged twice over. And in his hands is the Master Sword, the sword that seals the darkness, the light that shines when all other lights go out, restored to its full strength and far beyond by drinking the sacred power of the Light Dragon for eons. The hero beats the Demon King in a straight fight, proving to Ganondorf that he is a worthy opponent, a true challenger to the Gerudo's claim that might makes right. The Demon King recoils, shocked that this mere mortal was able to stand against him. He admits that he had missed the thrill of battle, the blood surging through his veins, and that he is not yet nearing the limits of his power. His secret stone glows, and the symbol for darkness shines out. He transforms again, this time into the Demon King, the master of the Secret Stone, a warrior completely consumed and transformed by darkness. Ganondorf's Demon King form not only resembles Demise, the original Demon King whose story is told in Skyward Sword, but also Raru. In many ways, Ganondorf is the polar opposite of this Zonai ruler a king of darkness rather than a king of light. Before killing Sonya, Ganondorf had coveted the immense power that Raru's secret stone granted him, and once he claimed his own, the form it changed him into closely mirrors Raru. Ganondorf's secret stone is fastened to his forehead, exactly where Raru's third eye, that which represents his enlightenment, is found. Like Raru, he has long, flowing hair and horns on his forehead. It's as if Ganondorf's secret stone had allowed him to transform into something he had always wanted to be. A king of his own making, with enough power to overthrow the King of Light and remake the world as he saw fit. Just as Raru had done. The Demon King laughs and faces Link, vowing to take far more than his arm this time. The hero of Hyrule is trapped, sealed inside the Heart of Gloom with a monster. He had managed to beat Ganondorf, the Gerudo King, in single combat. But now, with his secret stone unleashed, his power is overwhelming. This is the foe that had bested Raru and his six sages. But Hyrule had been given a second chance. The ancient sages had failed to stop Ganondorf, 
But here, thousands of years later, a new generation has risen against him. Echoing the battle at the climax of the Imprisoning War, the Sages join the fight alongside Link, just as Ganondorf summons phantom clones of himself from gloom. The Secret Stone has amplified the Demon King's power to terrifying heights. He is impossibly fast and impossibly strong, able to focus his dark magic into gloom projectiles that don't just disable Link's heart containers, but destroy them completely. This concentrated gloom is what had crippled Link and broken the Master Sword at the beginning of the game. And sure enough, it's able to tear through the hero's weapons and shields like paper. With one exception, the Master Sword. Though the Blade of Evil's Bane had been shattered by this gloom when Ganondorf broke free of the seal, it had since travelled to the distant past and spent thousands upon thousands of years in the head of the Light Dragon, absorbing Zelda's sacred power. Not only had the princess's sacrifice restored the blade, it had made it far stronger. Ganondorf's gloom can no longer touch it. The sword will instead reflect the darkness back at its master. Ganondorf's strength is directly countered by the sword that seals the darkness, whose blade reacts to the evil surrounding it and shines with a holy light. The Demon King dissolves his phantoms, gathering his gloom close to him, then throws it back out in a great wave, knocking the sages to the ground, too wounded to fight on. Ganondorf smiles and beckons Link towards him. Finally, he has met his match, someone with the strength to truly test him, an adversary worthy of his full strength. Again echoing the ancient battle, only one warrior remains on their feet to face the darkness. But where Raru could only seal the Demon King, Link can defeat him. By himself, he fulfills Zelda's wish and protects them all. Severely wounded by the Master Sword, Ganondorf recoils, holding his chest where Raru's hand had once sealed him. Then, as if once again held by the King of Light's hand, he is forced downwards, bent backwards into the position Link and Zelda had found him in in the imprisoning chamber. It's never made explicitly clear why Ganondorf regresses to this position when he's defeated. It's as if Link's strength, his arm which has been blessed by Raru's light, has reminded him of the seal that had held him for millennia. Ganondorf wasn't originally bent backwards like this. When Raru had first imprisoned him, the Demon King stood relatively straight. But by the time that the seal broke, he had moved to the centre of the chamber, folded completely backwards, like he was pinned by the power of the seal. And although he had been strong enough to break free from Raru's hold once the calamity on the surface disturbed Hyrule Castle, we know that Ganondorf isn't yet at full strength. He was forced to gather gloom and bathe in its dark power deep underground to recover from thousands of years of petrification. Perhaps being defeated by a hero wielding Raru's arm was enough to force him back into this position evidence of a deeper scar left by the seal on the Demon King. But he wasn't beaten yet. Ganondorf refuses to let a mere mortal stand in his way. He would give everything to destroy Link and grant himself the power to rule. And so, just like Princess Zelda, Ganondorf makes the ultimate sacrifice. He tears his secret stone from his forehead and swallows it, committing himself to an eternal existence as a dragon. The Demon King's eyes change as Draconification begins. He laughs as gloom fills the chamber, eventually forming a serpent, just like the form of Calamity Ganon that once haunted the castle. The serpent snatches Link in its jaws, then smashes through the stone above, tunneling through the earth until it reaches the surface. From below the castle, the demon dragon emerges into Hyrule, a titanic dragon dwarfing all others, with jet black scales and a blood red mane, and a jagged mess of horns crowning its head. 
Draconification wasn't Ganondorf's plan. This is a desperate attempt to ensure his victory. His self-imposed right to rule is based on his own strength. Now that Link has proven to be stronger, this is his final chance to gather enough power to dominate all opposition. His ideal world is that which existed before Raru founded Hyrule and brought order to the land. A place of chaos, one that valued courage and fighting spirit, one where only the strongest would thrive. By sacrificing himself and becoming the Demon Dragon, Ganondorf can cast Hyrule into an eternal night. He would become, for all intents and purposes, a dark god. Something powerful enough to ensure that the world is how he wants it to be. Forever. But Zelda had done the same. Like Ganondorf, she had sacrificed everything to ensure that her kingdom was how she wanted it to be. A place of hope and order. This sacrifice had placed the Master Sword in Link's hands, and now, the Light Dragon soars through the sky to join her knight in the final battle, a dance of dragons. Fittingly, Tears of the Kingdom ends in the sky. Like the two dragons in the game's logo, Link is caught between the Dragon of Light and the Dragon of Darkness in the climactic battle for Hyrule's future. He dives from the Light Dragon and lands on the Demon Dragon's back, where weak spots are exposed like red wounds along its spine. These weak spots are clusters of eyes, much like the Malice eyes that had proven to be weak spots with the Calamity, but these eyes are tinged with the gold and blue of a Draconified eye, resembling Zelda's and Ganondorf's after swallowing their secret stones. The Demon Dragon is colossal, many, many times larger than the Light Dragon or Dinral, Nadra and Farosh. From its jaws, it spits gloom, deadly projectiles which the hero must weave through to reach his target. Eventually, Link destroys each of the Demon Dragon's weak spots, revealing the final target, Ganondorf's Secret Stone, embedded in the forehead of the Demon Dragon. This is different to how Draconification worked for Zelda, who had swallowed her Secret Stone before clutching the Master Sword, which then became embedded in the Light Dragon's head. Ganondorf's Secret Stone becomes visible on the Demon Dragon only after all of his weak spots have been destroyed. Something about purging the evil that flows through it causes the stone to materialize, despite having already been consumed. Regardless, it is this Secret Stone, Sonya's Secret Stone, that had allowed Ganondorf to become this monstrosity. It was this ancient relic, once brought to the surface by Raru's Zonai ancestors to bring peace and prosperity to the land, that now threatened to cast it into darkness. Link dives from dragon to dragon for the last time, and plunges the Master Sword into the Secret Stone, shattering it and bringing an end to the Demon Dragon. In the end, Ganondorf's story ends in failure. He stole Sonya's secret stone and became the embodiment of hatred, but never truly recovered from Raru's seal. Until he emerges from below the castle as the Demon Dragon, Ganondorf never leaves the depths in the present. He remains imprisoned in the underworld, gathering the strength to fully resurrect himself. Though he shows the sages visions of his goals, of the world he wants to create, he's stopped before this ever happens. Ganondorf's limitless hatred for the kingdom he was sealed beneath gave birth to the Calamity, a monster of pure rage which was able to terrorize Hyrule on the surface. But it's unclear if Ganondorf was aware of these calamities. He never mentions them, and says to Raru that thousands of years will pass in the blink of an eye when he is sealed, implying that, for him, he was unaware of anything that happened between the distant past and the present day. But despite this, Ganondorf and the calamities he created 
have been the greatest existential threat to the kingdom for as long as history has been recorded. Finally, thanks to the sacrifice of its princess, Hyrule is saved. At long last, it is free from the endless cycles of prosperity and ruin. Link watches from the Light Dragon as the Demon Dragon explodes. Suddenly, his right arm begins to glow, with the eerie green-blue lights that represent spirit energy. A flash of light transports him to an ethereal plane of endless clouds, tinged in green. He floats as if underwater, now shirtless, with the gigantic mass of the light dragon just below him. As if moving by itself, Link's right arm lifts and points towards the dragon, and a golden light encircles it, just like that which appears when he uses the recall power, like when he had sent the Master Sword to the distant past. And he's not alone. The spirit of King Raru appears behind him, this time accompanied by his wife, Queen Sonia. This appears to be a sort of spiritual dimension, where ghosts of the long deceased can materialise before Link. Throughout his quest, he has received lights of blessing from Shrines of Light, structures built in the distant past by Raru and Sonia, each decorated with a statue of the royal couple at the end. Link's spirit appears to be drawn into this dimension by his hand, the hand which has absorbed lights of blessing from these shrines. So, while Raru and Sonia died long ago, their spirits survive through Link's arm, long enough to aid Zelda's chosen knight in one final act. Just like Sonia and Zelda had done during the defense of the Great Plateau, Sonia and Raru channel their powers through another. The light pouring out of Link's hand envelops the dragon, and its body sparkles with a golden glow, until the dragon is gone, and only Zelda remains, floating in the sky of spirits. Incredibly, Link's arm has changed too. Raru's hand and brace has vanished, and the scars from the Gloom Assault have healed. Sonya and Raru's spirits begin to fade. The couple hold hands one last time, then disappear entirely, their spirits finally at rest. In the distant past, Minoru had warned Zelda that the process of draconification was eternal, that there was no way for her to return to her original form after swallowing her secret stone. Yet here, Link, aided by the spirits of the ancient king and queen, is able to do just that. As if by magic, his hand is able to send forth a light that reverses an irreversible process. We're later told by Minoru's spirit that it was a combination of Raru's light powers and Sonya's time powers channeled through Link that was able to save the princess. But this solution doesn't make much sense. She herself admits that it's just a theory. Instead, it seems more likely that Link was able to use a more powerful form of recall, amplified by Sonya and Raru, to reverse the Light Dragon's trajectory through time, to walk her spirit back through the ages until before she ever consumed the stone. This might also explain why Link's arm returns to normal too. It could, of course, be that now Ganondorf, the source of gloom, is defeated, and Raru and Sonya's spirits have moved on, Link's arm is saved. But it could also be the case that it has simply reversed to a point in time before it was ever damaged. Either way, this entire spirit sequence is kept deliberately vague, and left up to the player's interpretation. But the result is clear. Link wakes as if from a dream, and finds himself upside down, mid-air, hurtling towards the surface. He looks around, then down, and spots Zelda, falling some distance below him. Link and Zelda's individual quests had begun at the same moment, when Link had failed to catch his princess, and she had fallen into darkness below the castle. He wouldn't fail again, not this time.
As a new day dawns in Hyrule, Link lays its princess down in the grass, and she opens her eyes, waking from a dream that lasted thousands of years. Her secret stone still hangs from her necklace, just as it had before she tore it free and swallowed it, which could support the idea that Link managed to recall her spirit back to before the Draconification. She touches the secret stone, and then realizes what has happened. The Master Sword had reached Link, and he had beaten the Demon King. Her plan had worked. She describes it as having been woken from a long dream by a warm, loving embrace. She doesn't really remember her time as the Light Dragon, though some part of her consciousness had been awake, enough to fight against the Demon Dragon. For millennia, she roamed above the clouds, but her memory from that time is fading. Tears of the Kingdom ends with a final cutscene, on the platform behind the Great Sky Island's Temple of Time, where Link had sent the Master Sword back to Zelda. Link, Zelda, and the four elemental sages gather before Minoru. The Sage of Spirit, Raru's sister, leaves the construct body that Link had built for her, returning to her spirit form. With Ganondorf's defeat, Minoru admits that the present day no longer needs her. She knows that she can let her spirit move on, to join Raru and Sonya, and the world will be safe in Zelda's hands. Just like the ancient king and queen, Minoru's spirit is scattered to the wind. Thousands of years ago, Zelda, along with Minoru and the ancient sages, had sworn their allegiance to Raru, the King of Light. They had sworn not only to save Hyrule from the immediate threat of the Demon King, but for it to see eternal peace, to defend it for all time. And now, in the present day, the new sages do the same, vowing to support Princess Zelda, the descendant of Raru and Sonya, and to protect her kingdom forever. Tears of the Kingdom ends on a very positive note. The evil that has threatened Hyrule since the founding of the kingdom has been destroyed, Zelda was saved from an eternal solitude as a dragon, and a new generation of sages have sworn to defend the land for all time. After Link and Zelda had destroyed Calamity Ganon at the end of Breath of the Wild, they spent the next few years rebuilding their kingdom, until the princess's disappearance and the upheaval once again threw Hyrule into turmoil. But with Ganondorf's defeat, the kingdom is completely free from its curse. Zelda and her chosen knight can lead Hyrule into a new age of prosperity to finally fulfill Zelda's wish of restoring the land to its former glory, and beyond. Tears of the Kingdom's developers have said that the game's key theme was hands, symbolizing not only the connections Link builds with the new sages, but between the two time periods the game takes place in, past and present. Link and Zelda's story splits the second their hands fail to meet, breaking the game's narrative into two separate halves that mirror each other, only to combine again at the climax. Breath of the Wild saw Link journey across a ruined kingdom alone, but in Tears of the Kingdom, this is never the case. The sage's vows are represented by rings on his fingers, as if his companions are literally holding his hand as he explores. But Ganondorf's hands also follow him. The nightmarish gloom hands that precede Phantom Ganon are one of the game's most terrifying and overwhelming enemies, a fitting successor to Breath of the Wild's signature guardian. In Tears of the Kingdom, hands are everywhere, from the abilities granted to Link by Raru's arm, to the sounds of hands clapping in the music. Fitting for a game about connections, about a kingdom starting to piece itself back together. Thank you so much for watching this video, the final episode of my three-part coverage of the main story and lore of Tears of the Kingdom. Like Breath of the Wild, this game reveals its story in a non-linear fashion, 
Not only how the dragon's tears memories are unlocked, but how important story details like the connection between Ganondorf and Calamity Ganon are only mentioned in dialogue with specific characters. This project is by far the biggest thing I've ever done on this channel. It has taken such a massive amount of time to piece together everything about this story and present it. So if you liked this video, leaving a like would be really appreciated, or if you want more Zelda content, consider subscribing. This won't be the last time I cover Tears of the Kingdom's lore and story. Cheers guys, and I'll see you next time.